Thank you everybody for joining us today for our Lightning Lunchtime QI Community Webinar. My name's Tony Lemke, I'm a GP in Austinville, which is in Northern New South Wales, where it's hot today, 33 degrees. Um, and it's pretty hot for us. The, uh, we're joined today by a good friend of the QI community and of the collaborative program, Charlotte Hespie, has been chair of a number of collaborative waves. She's uh, on the QI, on the, on the um, Improvement Foundation faculty, and she's chair of faculty at the uh, Australian College of GPs in New South Wales. Good afternoon, Charlotte. Uh, hi, Tony. Thank you for um, inviting me on today. And you're down in Glebe? The I'm down in Glebe, and mm. it's a pretty sunny, hot day here today too, but I'm completely protected from the heat in the wonderful air conditioning of the uh, offices of Glebe Family Medical Practice. So the one joy of, the, no, well, not the one joy, but one of the added joys of working on a day like today. Okay, thank you, Charlotte. Now, if, um, we'll be talking to Charlotte for the next half hour about the new atrial fibrillation guidelines. If you've got any questions for Charlotte, you can add them in our traditional way into the chat panel. I'll be keeping an eye on that and we'll try and address any concerns that you have, including those that have come to us before the meeting started. Now, Charlotte, you were, as we said, on the National Heart Foundation Australian Cardiac Society on the guidelines group that looked at the evidence of how we should diagnose and management atrial fibrillation. How did you find that experience? How did you go about that? Um, yeah, it was really interesting. It's the first um, guidelines group I've been on, and so it was interesting being a GP amongst um, a group of specialists but I, there were two GPs. Nick Zwa was also on the panel. Um, he was the official um, RAC GP um, rep and I'd been invited on as a GP who'd be, who's been involved in um, cardiovascular disease prevention and in particular some research around atrial fibrillation and the diagnosis in primary care. So the specialists um, come with their very, very specialised little tunnel view and it was really good to be able to actually sort of bring them back to earth about what does this actually mean in practice? Um, what can we do? You know, what does the evidence mean when you've got a complicated patient who's got more than just atrial fibrillation, et cetera? So yeah, it was a, a, a good experience all round. And well, well supported by the Heart Foundation. Thank you for representing general practice on this committee. We spoke with Ralph Audem at the end of last year about his experiences on the Heart Failure Committee, and I commend the summary of their guidelines to you. They're available on the QR Community website. And Ralph similarly represented general practice on that committee. So Charlotte, atrial fibrillation is important. Every second patient I see seems to be in AF. Uh, that's maybe just peculiar to Austinville. What is the, how often frequent do we see AF in general practice? Well, the, the figures say, as this slide does, that it's 2 to 4% of the population. What does that mean to us in primary care? It means that probably one in 500 um, over the age of 65 is at risk of having atrial fibrillation <clears throat> thing to go looking for it because it's common um, and, you know, you... you obviously seeing people who are probably more at risk than that. But if you're just talking general population, the odds goes down to being higher than than two sort of too many. But I said one in five hundred, so it's actually that's your screening population. So hence the two to four so, sorry I'm being very vague there. That's okay. Talking about screening then, as you say, it's a common condition and has high morbidity. Is atrial fibrillation therefore something we should be screening all our patients for and how do we do that? If we should. Recommended that there is a role for screening in general practice. What does that mean and what does that look like? Like point of care screening is recommended for the patients that we see age 65 and over. The screening means using an electronic device 
that, um, well, you can use your fingers, but the research shows that in fact, if you use an electronic device such as a, um, there's really easy devices that you get a patient to hold onto with both their hands for 60 seconds. It does, it's what we call a one lead trace for an ECG. And that is really good at either saying, no, they don't have atrial fibrillation or they do have um, atrial fibrillation or they have an abnormal trace that I'm not sure what it means. They've been validated. So in other words, that they, they are a good screening tool. They don't miss atrial fibrillation. They're more likely to tell you that they're not sure what it is than to, to miss it. And so therefore you then need to go on with those patients to do an ECG to confirm that they have atrial fibrillation. But you'll find if you start using them that the device is very accurate at picking it up. It's that, you know, iffy, iffy group. Um, that's where it's more useful to have the ECG as well. So Charlotte, I'm familiar with the Alive Core brand and with the app, I think they've changed the app name to Cardia with a K. Is that is that the sort of device that yes, you're referring to? Yep, absolutely. And they're they're not terribly expensive. My understanding is that you, you I mean you need a mobile phone um, to use it with. So it's about sort of dedicating a phone to do that, but they cost around I think two hundred dollars for to set it up well. And is that something that the, the nurses could do as part of their initial annual check screening? Is it within their capability? Absolutely. And that's a great question because that's where I've been involved in, in some of the trials in primary care in Australia. We've looked at just using the practice nurses and then we've also looked at using the practice nurses in conjunction with the GPs. Um, and they're about to look at patients doing a sort of a self-screening in the waiting room. My, my feeling is, is that the joint practice nurse GP program is really good. Where we did that is to say, look, this is something that you should be doing on an annual basis. Um, have a system around it. So in the studies that we have done, it's about aligning it with something like the flu vaccination program. Really, it aligns perfectly with flu vaccines because we are going to be trying to do everyone in our patient population to do a flu vax for 65s and overs anyway. And so if you actually have your little protocol of when someone comes in for their flu vaccine, that they actually get offered the screening for the AF at the same time and obviously need to build into that a system of, well, what if it comes back positive? Because obviously you then have to respond to that and what does that mean to the practice? So we've sort of developed a treatment flow chart, you know, if it comes back abnormal, what does the practice nurse do and what does the GP do so that we can make sure that the follow-up um, of somebody coming up as positive is appropriately cared for. So once again, practice is each practice as an improvement idea, develop their own systems for doing an annual check or documenting annually for every patient over 65, what rhythm they're in, are they in sinus rhythm, are they in atrial fibrillation, and then systems to make sure that that is a recurrent process. Yes, absolutely. If we don't have an alive call, we can, uh, I reckon I'm pretty good at feeling a patient's pulse and knowing if it's irregular. So until I get an alive, if I didn't have an alive call or it's not available because I can't find it because they're pretty small, and then uh, at least check the pulse. Would that be the yes. message? That's absolutely the message. And if you if you use an electronic um, heart blood pressure thing, if it comes back, you know how they come back sometimes when they're they're just not being accurate. That often means that they've got an irregular pulse that the machine isn't. So that's sometimes also worth going. Oh, maybe I should do an ECG on this patient as well. So there's a question come through, Charlotte. Um, you you recommend annual screening over the age of 65. You also said I think that AF is more um, prevalent as a patient gets older. Older, yep. Well, the, the, the stats show that, you, that, that you're going to get more prevalence. It's a similar thing to ischemic heart disease in that the, as we get older, the more damage that's being done to our heart through bits and pieces going on, but particularly in alignment with minimum, you know, small vessel disease, then your electrical pathways are more likely to get disturbed and then you have a higher risk of actually atrial fibrillation. And that then, there's a sort of, again, an alignment with <clears throat> that being uh, increased risk of um, stroke. So the, the whole cardiovascular disease prevention 
thing is really the older the patient gets, the more likely. But if you're actually going to get your bang for your buck, 65 is a really good age to start with. And as I said, in general practice, that works quite nicely because that's an age at which we also do, say, the flu vaccination program. And Dan wants to know, you won't be surprised, Charlotte, is there evidence that screening decreases the incidence of stroke? So is there a complete trial across the spectrum that shows that screening is helpful? We know that patients in AF are better, uh, well managed to have less incidence of stroke. Was there a trial of screening that showed a decrease in stroke rates? Did the committee find that evidence? Okay. So yes, so your the, the evidence is that if we pick up the through screening an asymptomatic population that we decrease their risk of stroke and yes it is worth it. If you pick up someone through um, a device, so for instance, if you have a patient who's got a pacemaker, if you do if you, if you pick up AF through a patient who's already got a pacemaker or some other device or something else going on, there is not nearly so much bang for your buck because I'm not all that sure why and I don't know that the cardiologists do either, but the asymptomatic otherwise screening population of your practice of 65s and over, if you pick them up, it, you do make a difference in stroke rates, which is why the cardiologists and um, who have sort of been involved in this work have been so passionate about starting a prevention program through screening. All right, so that's the best available evidence. Charlotte, once we've uh, diagnosed atrial fibrillation, either through screening or whatever means by presentation or because it's symptomatic, how do we work that up? What's the first step? So the, the first step is confirming it in terms of the general practice. So you've done your ECG, you're sure that you've done it. So then it's really the, the diagnostic workup recommendations that the guidelines um, have said is that you need to actually screen out all of their risk factors, comorbidities, um, and make sure that there isn't anything else going on that you're not um, treating properly, that you um, need to sort of look at what other sort of cardiovascular disease, burden, weight, other risk factors for for that particular patient. But there is also a role for the transthoracic echocardiogram um, for the new patient because it actually is able to properly identify is there valve disease, is there damage in their left, left ventricular function um, and size. So that's the only sort of particular other thing that as a GP we need to refer off to do and that obviously has repercussions for rural or um, more regionally located um, GPs who it might be harder to know how to access that type of test. Okay, so um, ideally one would identify the other risk factors, manage those as well as one possibly can and arrange for an echocardiogram to be done at the earliest available opportunity. So in the management then, having identified, yes, confirmed the diagnosis of AF, referred off for the echo, I like the way the guidelines break arrhythmia management down into two simple pathways. There's rate control and rhythm control. That's been a dilemma for us. How did you come out? What did the, what did the, the, the specialist group decide? Yeah, so they basically said too, yes, so the, the, the really important things are that you need to decide what you're going to do and what your sort of um, the most important priorities for that particular patient are and generally rhythm um, will be favoured over rate for look at the slide, it's sort of got those particular criterion versus those who um, have minimal symptoms and who otherwise are sort of likely, you know, you've, you've got other other difficulties. So those who've got, um, who are young, active, and it's sort of paroxysmal, then definitely it's the rhythm over the rate. Otherwise, it's the rate. I think that's the easiest way of looking at it. Okay, so we use a uh different agents depending on the strategy 
we've chosen. Let's talk about rate control first. Yep. So with rate control, I don't think that there's really anything particularly new in the guidelines around that. Um, I'm happy to take some, some questions. So it's really the, the use of the beta blocker, particularly acutely, um, and then there's sort of the specific instructions in the guidelines about, you know, for certain patients. But I think the, the take home les lesson is that the role of the beta blockers here um, and that digoxin for, for particular patients um, is still indicated. Um, so that's the acute sort of setting and then long term, again, it continues to be beta blockers um, and or the calcium channel um, antagonists, um, depending upon the tolerance of the patient really rather than any evidence-based benefit of one over the other. And digoxin is still there. Digoxin will always be with us. Yeah. So for rate control, I note Amy had her own last line given the monitoring and toxicity requires. And if we're going for the rate control, interestingly, give up on the rhythm control a bit. Don't go for, you don't need to have a foot in each barrel. So not using the flaconidosolol if rate control is the strategy yep. long term that you've chosen. And um, for rhythm control then, Charlotte? So, sorry, one of the, the important things for rhythm control is, is again, this is where I sort of quite like it as the new stuff for the, the GP. So it's about the role of the um, electrical conversion. So that is very much needs to be considered con, um, acutely for that, that hemodynamically unstable patient, which again, probably, you know, isn't going to be the one that you pick up, obviously, um, as a screening. It's going to be more that acute presentation, unwell patient that you have to send off urgently to hospital. But the electrical conversion, again, still can be considered for somebody who you want, you actually sort of feel that they've failed trials of the pharm pharmacology. Um, apart from that, it's the, the flecainide and the otorone to see if you can get them out of it. And again, so, so nothing particularly um, new, but again, it's about the role of the, um, the transthoracic um, esophageal echocardiogram in terms of making sure that they don't have <clears throat> the atrial thrombus if you're going to do them down the track. So it looks like, Charlotte, then for if, if rate control is within the province of general practice, absolutely. Rhythm control, we shouldn't start we should be it, unless they've had the esophageal, unless they had an esophageal echo, which sort of takes it out of the domain of most general practice. Yeah, I didn't know. I suppose that that everything. knowing when you do that. Yes, so get your transesophageal um, scan done. If you don't have a sort of an easy access to a cardiologist, you can make the decision on that as to whether you seek advice to mm. whether the role of cardioversion is for that particular patient or not. Um, and so I think that, you know, that still in our decision making for those of us who have more sort of holistic management of the patient and aren't just referring off when a diagnosis of AF is made, which I, I think is, you know, some of some people feel more comfortable giving it off to the specialist to take care of right at the point of diagnosis through to those of us who quite enjoy managing it all apart from the bits that the specialists need to do. Um, and quite, we can quite happily ask them to do just that procedure to help manage the patient. So whether started by us or by the cardiologist, a lot of our patients will end up on either flecainide or amiodarone or sotalol for rhythm control. These are potentially quite toxic medications and uh, Charlotte and require significant monitoring. Yep, yep. I mean, I, I don't know about you, Tony, but certainly my patients don't like these medications. Um, so if you can get get that um, cardio version, then it seems to be a much better outcome for everybody. And they all really are how tolerated it is and how good people feel once they go back into normal rhythm without the drugs. 
And so there's a question being asked, did the panel look at uh, flaconide has a role in rhythm control, but some evidence for increased mortality. Um, that would have been addressed by the panel, Charlotte. Does it come to mind? Yeah. It's about balancing the risk of who that patient is and what their other their other risk factors are, isn't it? Um, that it that it has a role, but you want to be just careful about. I mean, my my preference is if you can get away with no drugs for it, then that's good. But yes, there's going to be some, and there's going to be the side effect profile of both those drugs. If you ask me, you know, you have to have that conversation about what what's, what's off for them, particularly if they're frail. So some of our patients uh, will be recommended to have a percutaneous catheter ablation. Was that uh, was ablation surgery supported by the panel? Uh, yes, but again, for the for the patients that are appropriately selected. So it's um, there was a lot of discussion about these, not, not surprisingly. So those who do this sort of procedure were obviously far more with it, but I think the evidence is um, is there that it is actually effective for the right patients. And about a third of them are going to have to have it done twice if, if uh, due to lack of success the first time um, and, and some major complication rates, about 1%. And they need to stay on the anticoagulation, which we'll talk about next, if that's okay, Charlotte. So the real mainstay of management of atrial fibrillation, apart from rate control in general practice, is about preventing strokes. And I would anticipate that was a hot topic of discussion among the group. Yeah, well, it certainly drive, drives a lot of their passion. Um, and because if you can prevent something as awful as a stroke happening, um, it's it's worthwhile because the amount of morbidity mortality um, associated with strokes is so significant. Um, again, I don't know if this is my experience of patients is that they would that that's what they really don't want um, going into elderly old age is to have a, a stroke and survive with considerable. Um, So it's about then deciding who, who we can actually make a difference on that anticoagulant thing. So that's where the difference with this, these guidelines for us are the, the, I love all of these acronyms. So the CHAR2DS2VA score, um, which is the sexless previous char 2 chad or ds 2 vasc score. Um, and really, again, this was about actually um, Making it easier, and the that really that the was seen by the panel that there was not enough difference, and it was making making it less complicated and less cumbersome. Actually, was a benefit to everybody. So, so the chads, to chads, that chad, that score that you're talking about, I guess that's available in a calculator for us to use on all our patients. Yep. Yep. There's, if we go down to the next score, next slide, um, you'll see how you calculate it um, and the points that you get. So you can see basically they've taken out your gender. Okay. And um, so we calculate that that score. I don't. It's not a CHADS score, it's not a CHADS VAS score, it's, I don't, I don't know how you abbreviate it, Charlotte, but whatever. Yep. We, calcul <laughs> we calculate that score and then we, you can use that for shared decision making with our patients where we weigh up the risk of bleeding from anticoagulation against the risk of having a thrombotic or embolic stroke. Yep. And if you go to the next slide, I think that then gives us some of those sort of helpful sort of things to think about when you're actually trying to figure out what your risk of bleeding might be. Because I think that's one of the hardest conversations to have, isn't it? You know, having a stroke is so dreadful, bleeding, but 
what what happens if I then bleed, and who's more likely to bleed, um, and where where do I make that cutoff point, and how do I do that, etc. So this slide I think helps a little bit in terms of helping us think about um, some of those things for our patients. Okay. And so having done the CHAD score, it's either going to be the important factors, whether it's zero, which is nearly nobody in my experience, one, which is some people, or two or more. That's the, the three critical decision-making points on the flow chart. So how do we, how do we interpret the CHAD score? Right, there's, a, there's, the flow, there's a flow chart that sort of looks at that. Um, so yes, so you say if you've got a zero, then you just, you don't need to consider it. One, it's the Yep, you can consider it, but other than that, it's definitely recommended that it's probably going to outweigh your, <clears throat> that your risk of having a stroke is higher than maybe your risks of, of bleeding. Um, but you still need to have that conversation about what those, the contraindications might be and <clears throat> what you might need to do. So that's where you have the conversation about the deciding whether it's a warfarin, um, a NOAC, um, or, you know, issues which, um, the other options. So it's really, the, the NOAC, as you can see, comes out as being the preferred. So NOAC's generally in Warfarin second line is the current, is the current thinking. And did the committee have a position on whether we should favour favor any particular NOAC or a NOAC that has a reversible agent, or was that uh, not considered well, important? For the conversation, it was, and I think that the evidence, was, and that was because there there was really no research that's showing that one is pre more preferable to the other. So, all right. So, when um, the score is one. Do we have numbers to aid our discussion with the patient, number needed to treat, number needed to harm? Is that information available to us somewhere? Thank you, that's a good question. I can go and find that for you. I don't have it off the top of my head. Okay. And the other question that came from the floor was one of the, the first component of the CHAD score is whether somebody has a history of congestive heart failure. Is there an ejection fraction cutoff that we can use to score that either as a one or a zero? I would be going to the, the new guidelines for the congestive cardiac failure because it's changed the ejection fraction score in those guidelines. And okay. I would be going with that definition. Nice answer. We'll it give Chris would... Mitchell the opportunity to look that up. That's his homework since he asked the question. Yep. Um, but again, it's off the top of my head, I, I would be, it's better not to say, but just to say that's where I would go look if I wasn't talking into a microphone for a webinar. Did, uh, does um, Charlotte, once we identify AF on the ECG, was there a position on whether we should start anticoagulation immediately that day or within a time frame? Did we is there any advice from the panel about that? Basically, it was to start it as soon as you can, as long as you've had the conversations with the patient and you've done an appropriate risk assessment yourself with them and had those conversations. But the sooner the better. Um, they all had stories about the time delays in someone getting anticoagulation and having strokes. And I suppose that's always one of those um, issues about how you know how long is safe and it's, you know how hard is it to thread a needle how do you find a needle in a haystack those are sort of pretty up much unanswerable questions the risk is the risk for that particular patient okay um, so we'll be keen to find out those number that needed to treats uh, the, the rate of embolic stroke for the shared decision-making conversation we have with our patients. It would be lovely to be able to say you have a risk of stroke of one in 20. If we start you on this medication, it comes down to one 
in 100, the risk of bleeding is such and such. Really useful, those numbers and charts to have this discussion with our patients. Well, I'm happy to go back to um, and try and find some numbers for you. We will have a look together. Um, we could start, so Charlotte, the question we did here, not to start flecainide or rhythm control until an echo was performed, but there's no need to delay starting anticoagulation until an echo can be performed. Is that correct? Absolutely correct. Because what you're wanting to do is prevent the thrombus formation in the, in the heart in the first place. So the sooner you get that done, the better. All right. And the, the final point about anticoagulation was the panel recommended point of care testing for INR for those on warfarin as being the preferred way of monitoring warfarin. Is that correct, Charlene? Yep, absolutely. And, and certainly... Those, uh, no, it's expensive, so, and it's still not um, paid for, though I believe there is a recommendation that we there will be an item number for it at some point. That's come through the, um, the recommendations. Okay, thank you, Charlotte. And so did the panel look at integrated care for the patient, the overall team-based approach to managing patients with atrial fibrillation? Yes, wasn't it, isn't it good? The, the specialists actually also too acknowledge the, the role of GPs in all of this, because as far as I'm concerned, the, and we sort of alluded to, really this is a general practice illness that can be easily managed um, for the, the, the majority of patients with atrial fibrillation is obviously going to be a number of complicated ones who need to have expert specialist advice apart from those the, the, the um, investigations that we can't do, the echo, the transesophageal echo the, um, and the ablation and the um, defibr defibrillation. The, I just think this is a this is a primary care illness, but we also need to recognise the roles of the team in that care as well, and how that might, what that might look like, and sharing the information of what we're doing, why we're doing, where that decision making comes from, and so we can ensure that at all times the patient is well managed um, when things happen. Fantastic. All right. Thank you for that. Um information. Charlotte, thank you for the work you've done on that committee representing general practice and for sharing what you learnt with us today. The, uh, did, did the panel have any, on the team-based approach, did the panel have any recommendations how often, I know our patients tend to get recalled to cardiologists very frequently uh, for echoes. Did the panel have a recommendation whether that was actually helpful or necessary or was that not addressed? That wasn't addressed as such because I think that's one of the controversial areas of the cardiologists and their Medicare rebates at this point in time as well. So ours was more looking at the role of it in the diagnosis and then in decision making. We certainly didn't, didn't look at it in terms of um, ongoing review of the patient with it um, and I, that was out of scope and certainly my understanding is that I don't think there's a role for it unless there's something changed. Okay, well that's fantastic. So Charlotte, we've discussed um, the need to have systems to screen for, general, screen for atrial fibrillation general practice, that we can focus on rate control, particularly for those who are symptomatic, that we should use shared decision making to score our patients as a risk of stroke and to discuss advantages of anticoagulation with them and to work as a team. So that's been very helpful and we thank you for joining us from Glebe today. I hope you have a good afternoon session with, with your patients. Thanks, Tony. You too. It's so, not too hot thanks. for everybody out there today. So thank you for those who joined us on the webinar. Thank you for Alison and QI Community Central and we'll get back to you about what our topic is next month. Bye-bye. <laughs>